now that we've talked about what frameworks are in general and talked a little bit about what frameworks mean in Android, let's zero in even further in the context of Android concurrency frameworks. And so I'm going to start by motivating why do we need these things in the first place? What's the benefit we get from uh, concurrency frameworks? So it turns out that there's a number of design constraints that are baked into Android that concurrency frameworks are designed to address. And we've talked about these a little bit before, but I'm going to go a little deeper now, and I'll give you some pointers to places that show what happens when you don't follow the rules and you disobey these design constraints. One of the design constraints is that the user interface thread cannot block for more than a short time, like a couple of seconds. Otherwise, you'll end up getting the dreaded application not responding or ANR dialog popping up. So if you've ever written an Android app that did too many things in the main thread, you'll get something like this. It'll say, uh, you know, something or other isn't responding. Do you want to close it? So you can either say, yes, I want to close it, or I want to wait and let it run a little bit longer. That's the application not responding dialog. And uh, this means that the UI thread cannot be used for stuff that runs for a long time, like downloading a big file or grabbing a lock that will be held for a while, something like that. So you can't use the UI thread for everything. Another interesting quirk is that networking calls, in other words, socket calls, downloading files, sending files to the network, those are actually explicitly disallowed on the user interface thread by default. Now, there's some tricks you can play to disable it. If you want, you can disable that restriction if you want. But if you don't disable it, and you probably shouldn't be disabling it, you'll end up getting a runtime exception that says the, uh, you tried to do a networking operation on the main thread. Yet another thing, which you talked about before, but now we can zero in a bit more in terms of, of Android, non-user interface threads, in other words, threads that are not the UI thread, the specific UI thread, can't access UI toolkit components directly. So they can't access the dialogues and widgets and menus and buttons. You can only access those widgets and toolkit components from the specific user interface thread. And the reason for this, as we've mentioned before, is that these UI toolkit components are not thread safe. They're not designed to be accessed by anything other than one thread of control for a variety of reasons. So as a consequence of these constraints, the Java concurrency mechanisms that we've talked about, threads and the executor framework and all that good stuff, really are not adequate to address Android's concurrency constraints by themselves. The concurrency mechanisms actually work pretty well for the background threads. But for the foreground threads, because of these special constraints that Android has, you really can't use the Java stuff by itself. So that then motivates the use of these Android concurrency frameworks, which, of course, we're going to talk about in a second. And the two frameworks we're going to talk about, as you can see from this picture with the little uh, Android robot with threads in him, are the Hammer framework. What's the name of the Hammer here? What's that? Molnir, right? Thor's hammer, so Molnir. Why I know that, I'm not sure, but it's a good thing to know. Um, and then the second thing is we have the async task framework, which we'll see has a bunch of things that has like a checklist of stuff to do. So we'll see how that works. If you want to see what happens if you have, uh, if you don't obey these rules, I've got a little example called the buggy downloader, which is its sole purpose in life is to tell you what not to do. And this motivates the need for these frameworks. And what it does is uh, buggy one, right? If you click buggy one, it will throw an exception since it's trying to download the image in the user interface thread. So you're trying to do a network operation, which is uh, verboten. And buggy two will throw an exception since a user interface component is being accessed by a, a non-user interface thread, by a background thread. So these are just fun things to demonstrate what will happen if you try to break the rules. So this one, for example, says, only the original thread that created the view hierarchy could touch its views. And that just means you're trying to access things with a background thread. OK, so that's the end of that quick discussion of Android concurrency frameworks. So now that you know a little bit about Android concurrency frameworks, in particular the design constraints that, uh, that they're there to, to address, Let's talk about the structure and functionality of Android's concurrency frameworks. And this will get us a chance to talk about 
the two different frameworks that will be the focus of the course, one of which is the focus for your next assignment. So the two frameworks are the handlers, messages, and runnables framework, or the hammer framework, and the second one is the Android async task framework. They share some common components, which we'll talk about, but they're also very different in other ways, and they have pros and cons to their application. So there are these two frameworks. The hammer framework allows operations to run in one or more background threads, these guys, and these frameworks can post and or send runnables and or messages, respectively, uh, known as the results, to the user interface thread. And we'll see what they do is the threads run in the background, and I'll go through the two common use cases here. Let's say we have a background thread running, and it wants to post a runnable to the UI thread. And usually that runnable contains something that will end up displaying a message or prompting the user or something or other, something that involves UI uh, interaction. So what happens is you make a runnable, and the background thread posts that runnable via a handler, and that handler is associated with a message queue, which is managed by a looper, and the looper will basically sit there pulling messages out of the message queue, and then it'll dispatch them in the context of the user interface thread. So that's how a background thread can post a runnable to the user interface thread. Likewise, a background thread could send a message via a handler that's associated with a message queue in a user interface thread, and that message queue is managed by a looper, which will pull the message out of the message queue and dispatch it via something called handle uh, message in the context of the user interface thread. Interestingly enough, both runnables and messages are treated as messages internally by the Android framework, and runnables have a little bit of extra glue code in order to be able to handle them in a slightly different way by calling their, their uh, run method back. So that's essentially what the, the Hammer framework does. And one of the things to remember about the Hammer framework is you as an application developer interact directly with messages or runnables, handlers, and then there's a looper that's kind of hidden from you and a message queue that's kind of hidden from you, but you work with threads, handlers, messages, and runnables. Those are all things that are part of the programming interface that you interact with. And remember that, because we'll come back and talk about that later when we talk about the async tasks. Async tasks allow operations to run in one or more background threads, and they can publish their results to the user interface thread without directly manipulating threads, handlers, messages, or runnables. So the key thing here is you've got a better, well, thought through abstraction called an async task, and various things happen inside that async task because it's a framework, and it calls back to all kinds of interesting hook methods that we'll talk about. And so it allows you to do all this concurrent operations, but you don't have to directly know anything about threads or handlers or messages or runnables. So it's a bit more invisible. The, the mechanisms are a bit more invisible to you, and it's more like programming with objects, whereas the hammer framework opens up the kimono and gives you more of the piece parts to work with directly. And as you might expect, there are, there are pros and cons of these different approaches. Here are some of the ways we can evaluate the pros and cons. You can evaluate them in terms of how usable they are for simple operations or simple tasks, how usable they are for more complex tasks, how scalable they are, how flexible they are, and how efficient they are. And so I won't go through all this in great detail right now. We'll talk about this later. But in a nutshell, the async task is typically easier to use once you understand it, especially for more complex use cases. Um, it's more scalable because it has a pool of threads that it can leverage to run things in a, in a pool elastically. And um, it's a little bit less flexible, a little bit less efficient because there's more stuff going on in the framework. And you can see basically that the posting of runnables or sending of messages are harder to use, but they tend to be a little more flexible, a little more efficient, because there's not as much stuff going on in there. So it's a classic trade-off between giving you powerful things, which are a little bit slower, versus making you do more work, but it's more efficient. So it's classic um, complexity performance trade-off. We typically use these frameworks, kind of going back to our original point, we use these frameworks in order to be able to decouple 
the user interface interactions, which have to take place in the main thread, the UI thread, from longer running computations and or communications that take place in background threads. So the way that works is that the long duration and potentially blocking operations run in the background threads, which are either spawned by you or spawned by the async task framework. And then the short duration user facing operations run in the user interface thread. So the stuff that actually interacts with the user is done in one way, one place, one context, the UI thread, and the longer running stuff takes place in the background threads. And the frameworks are there to mediate those interactions. And that's why they go above and beyond the Java concurrency mechanisms, which don't know anything about these constraints. So let's take a look at an example. Um, you might have background threads that are performing long duration operations, like downloading images, using our image example. Um, there's this synchronized message queue, which is used to convey the messages or, or runnables from background threads into the looper that's managed by the UI thread. And then those things will be dispatched in the context of the user interface thread. So we can make sure that that constraint is always abided. And then the user interface thread could do something to interact with the user, like display the image, for example, which cannot be displayed by the background thread. OK, so that's the quick overview of the framework. We're next going to talk in more detail about the async task framework so you get a chance to see how it works in all of its full-blown glory.